Hello, everyone. Welcome, and it's great to be here and share, hear everyone else speak and share my research with you. So just a little background on myself. So my work, my personal work, has been um, working with micro and small um, enterprises globally that work to provide jobs to usually hand workers or what you call home workers around the world. So that's within the informal economy who are usually women who are really at risk um, when they're not kind of included in a formal work environment. And so I've worked across the world in India, Haiti, Guatemala, um, Southeast Asia. And uh, further back in my journey in my career, I actually lived in Cambodia and started a social enterprise working with rural um, artisans and giving them economic opportunity. So my research is really looking at um, women's empowerment and economic inclusion, knowing that, um, oh, let's see. Here we go. So one of the things that we know is that women are often excluded from the workforce. Um, and by giving them opportunity, it will help bring them out of poverty. And this is especially exacerbated in the global south. And when women are marginalized, uh, they don't have the same opportunity. And when if they are socially stigmatized, it becomes even more pronounced. Um, and they know it's harder to find work and gainful employment. And if they happen to find employment, women who are stigmatized, it becomes even more stressful because oftentimes their stigmas are hidden. Um, and so they can't kind of make them known to the people around them. So through my work, I've been fortunate to kind of um, talk to many of the leaders that start um, social enterprise organizations that are really focused on employing these women. Um, but in this, it becomes really important that they think about how they're organizing um, these women within their organiza organization and how they are treating them and helping them to understand the positive um, experience that they can have at work. Um, and as I started to talk to some of these leaders and, and the women themselves, they were talking about how they really liked work um, and that they were given new opportunities, but I didn't have time to kind of sit there and always you know, spend an enormous amount of time with them. And I started to think about this outside the lens of a, of a, you know, a Western corporation, thinking that these women may really kind of like the same things that we like. Um, and how does, how does work kind of impact them? And how should we be looking at these women who usually don't have the opportunities that we have? What, is, what does work mean to them? Um, and so that's where I wanted to kind of focus my research, was, was really looking at how does formal employment um, in an organization impact these socially stigmatized women. Um, and I can, kind of took some of these pictures here where they look like happy, they're working, but what is kind of very pronounced in all of these, and they're kind of taken from different organizations that I know, is that all of these women have some sort of um, social stigma that's hidden, so you don't see it. So they could be, they could have HIV, they could have been formerly been um, sex workers who are often stigmatized in their communities or just single mothers um, with, within their communities. So it's oftentimes these hidden sigmas that may not be kind of, you know, outward, but then do inhibit these women from working. Oh, so this is not showing up, so I will talk through this. Um, so this is a picture here that you kind of see the outline of. So I did my case study on Tonle, which is a 10-year-old social enterprise fair trade organization based in Cambodia. They do zero waste production, and they um, taking kind of scraps of um, garments or waste from the garment industry in Cambodia and turn it into new woven products or sewn goods. And their primary, they started off with their mission to provide stable economic means to um, women um, and opportunity and person, um, personal pride by really focusing on employing their first set of employees were women who had HIV, many who were single mothers now because their husbands had passed away. Um, many who had, didn't have the opportunity to work in organizations 
organizations that supported them. They may have not even had opportunity to work, um, or they may have been in the garment, traditional garment factory work where because of their HIV and their conditions, A, they couldn't reveal it, and, and B, um, even with having it, is maybe they didn't reveal it, reveal it, but they were often getting sick. And traditional garment factories do not have great you know, medical leave policy or support them. Um, there is a, you know, especially back in the day when they first started, so this would have been like 10 or so years ago, the social stigma around HIV in Cambodia was a lot more, um, was worse than it is today. There's been a lot more education socially, but it, but it still persists. So the founder, Rachel of, of Tonle, um, she w she's from the US. She committed to kind of employ um, going there, training the, these women and employing them. So um, I went there, and during this time, actually last year, I wasn't able to make it to, for those of you in uh, cohort three, to the research um, boot camp. I was actually in Cambodia conducting my research, uh, doing some dial-ins to some of the sessions, but I spent about a week and a half on site at the Tone Lay Workshop in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And I interviewed 23 women. And it was, it was amazing. It was this kind of these interviews that I kind of really think about if you're talking about grounded theory. I had to kind of adapt to kind of what was going on. I had to be very sensitive to the women and their, their backgrounds. I think one of the things that helped me out is that I had lived in Cambodia. Um, so while I don't speak Khmer, I have very, I, I speak a little bit, but not enough to conduct an interview. Um, I did know and could read their body language, so I had lived in the culture and understand some of those nuances. And I had an interpreter, a female interpreter, so that the women would feel comfortable, who this interpreter actually knew the, fa the founder of the organization as well, which was, I think, very important. The first day that I went in, I didn't do any sort of picture taking. I did not do, um, I didn't kind of like take notes. I just observed and walked around and really got to know the women, asked some questions, sat down, um, tried to help them with their chores. And throughout the whole week, because not every day I was kind of doing all these interviews, but I started to, and like Paul was saying, at, uh, at Keystone, he, he had a job. I was there and I would help them do different tasks and things. So just to kind of really kind of understand what they were doing and just kind of sit there and see how they work and interact with each other. Um, and the other thing that I did was really interesting is I did a focus group at the end um, and kind of taking all the um, information from the interviews that I had heard over the, the, first, the first week and then synthesize that down to a group activity that we all did together to kind of see if those insights that I had heard, which was there were all very similar themes, if they kind of re, um, if they came out again in a group activity. So one of the th key things I found is that women do f flourish when, you know, they have, when Tonle was able to reframe new possibilities that um, they never had before by helping them with their work skill, focusing on their health at work, so saying that this is a priority, we don't want you to be sick, and really helping them with their futures um, and thinking about that. And you know, the, the founder at Tonley said, if they, if they ever leave here, I want them to have the skills that they can go and do something else, maybe within the, the garment industry, but we don't want to pigeonhole them into anything. Um, and this was all done within a trustful, respectful, and safe work environment. And this really created a strong connection for the women to Tonle, the organization, and each other. And I like to say, because of the, the type of work that it was, and I took a lot of pictures, that, you know, like the, it was personally transformed transformative for the women, but it was also, it was like the weaving process and, and how they worked because of the, the production. They actually took de deconstructed garments or remnants and kind of repurposed them into something new that was, you know, something with a renewed kind of like purpose um, for themselves, but then like the product. So this all comes down to kind of my key findings was that there was this, you know, the concept of transformative organizational identification um, and through kind of my research that this was a new concept to organizational theory, um, especially, you know, when you look at organization and, and um, 
social construction, you don't necessarily see this group researched or um, looking at what are the impacts of organization and social. So this was a new, a new concept to organizational identification, which if you kind of read about it and learn about it, is really about kind of oneness with an organization. So it took it that one step further and illustrated that you know, by focusing on social value, an organization can um, create accommodations and be uplifting for a marginalized employee. Um, and through this, the process of this, and it is a process because of the women's background of coming from um, uh, a background where they didn't necessarily have work opportunity, were, were stigmatized maybe within their communities and socially isolated, that there was a pr recursive process of, of sense making that involved sense giving or sense breaking, sense giving, and sense making. So first there was um, sense breaking. Um, and this is how it began, and I would say this is a very vital part of um, the process of the women joining Tone Lay, or if you think about it, in, um, of maybe someone who hasn't worked in a safe um, work environment. So, you know, being in this kind of safe work environment, um, they were able to kind of leave this um, space of persistent exposure to stereotypes and discrimination that really exacerbated. Um, their vulnerabilities and perpetuated um, when they weren't in that environment their low confidence. So um, Tony really had to work around um, understanding these gaps in the knowledge that the women might have and take that and use this information to kind of foster experiences that would allow the women to kind of feel empowered and leave their kind of negative self-concepts of themselves behind and really kind of look at making sure that they had confidence in what they were doing. So they built, um, they were really kind of focused on building the women's skill set so that every woman, you know, they had an opportunity to learn. And I remember people saying to me during the interviews, like, you know, I asked, I asked Rachel, what can I do? I don't know how, I don't know how to do any of this. Um, sorry, I'm speaking in my like translation. <laughs> this is how they, you know, simple language translated. And them saying, she told me it was okay. We will find something for you to do. And they did. Um, so there was always this kind of learning. You have the capability to learn. Um, and your stigma doesn't prohibit you from, from learning new skills. So they had skill building. They had this kind of continuous positive reinforcement um, for the women and encouraging them to try new skills even when it was difficult. Um, and you know, they're very adamant about you know, non-discrimination as part of the organization. At the beginning it was really easy, but and as the organization grew, they started having people who were not stigmatized. Um, so they made it clear in the interview process that, you know, this is our organization. You might, you will work with people who are sick and they were open about this. Are you okay with this? And if they, I don't think they, I don't, Rachel never told me if they had anyone that said no, but the, everyone agreed. And you would have the people who were non-stigmatized and saying, yeah, yes, I had never worked with people like this before, but they, they're like my family now. Um, so I think, you know, one of the key things that I kind of really took away is that this sense breaking process for the women was very kind of vital for them kind of really joining the organization um, and beginning their transformation. The next step in the process that I found was this, once, you know, they felt confident was this um, component of sense giving where there was the, the Tonley organization and then everyone else was this fostering of kind of good working relationships and a community so that the women didn't feel isolated anymore. So they could work with each other, um, accept and understand and share stories, but you know, really kind of collaborate in their work. And I think this really kind of showed up in, in, in the women's lives before. Maybe they were in, you know, they were working in isolation or in assembly lines in the garment factories, but Tonle wanted to create this community. So they created this clustered workshop area so that people could actually, Rachel told me this, they could look at each other in the face and in the eyes, which in, if you ever see pictures of a garment factory, they're all kind of down looking at their sewing machines. And she's like, that's kind of not human. Um, so she really wanted to kind of create this so they can kind of talk to each other. They also had team-based production, which is kind of a very um, kind of novel concept, maybe more Western, where they worked in 
pod. So they would have a team that would work from the beginning to the end of the product that they were making, which really helped kind of this c collaboration and sharing their knowledge. So there were, were people they could, they are like, I'm an expert in this type of technique. Um, they could go to their managers who would help them. The managers would actually get and kind of sew with them. So there was this really kind of collaborative environment, which really helped kind of create more community, but then also help build their confidence along the way. So that's where it kind of became recursive. Um, and really helped to kind of create this common purpose and bond to the organization and to each other. And finally, um, their, with their newfound kind of self-legitimacy and kind of their building relationships, they were really able to make sense of their role within, within the organization. Um, and I think pivotal to this was um, Tone Lay's kind of values and their ethos of, you know, that it was built on trust and respect and non-judgment and they all worked hard together and that kind of came through. I've never heard an organization say, so many people saying the same thing. We work hard together. We are a family. We work hard together. We want to do the best that we can do for Tone Lane. They took really great pride in that. Um, you know, they still had their continuous skill building and learning from each other. Um, their encouragement from the leaders and each other, um, which, you know, you had a lot of the younger women who maybe didn't have the HIV. They came and they're like, we go to, you know, we go to Ivana and ask her for, for help. She really knows how to do this. Um, she's the quality control person. She knows and she will tell us if, the, if our products are good. Um, and they also had a lot, you know, like mission oriented posters that reinforced everything. They had daily team lunches and they even did a team retreat every year to kind of bond with each other and they invited their families. And I think this really offered a sense of purpose and support structure that you know help these women um, and kind of really identify and build a bond with Tonley but with each other um, and this is something that you wouldn't get in any organization especially for um, employees or individuals working in the global south this doesn't you know I think us in our work environments this might be commonplace but in these organizations it's not um, so this case really exemplified to me that you know a safe work um, environment amongst a kind of supportive community can kind of really help the women connect and thrive and have a renewed sense of independence um, and hope that they maybe didn't have and it um, really helps it be a transformative kind of work experience and um, opportunity for them. Um, yeah, and it's something that I just haven't hadn't seen a lot in all my in all my work, and I think it's really important as we think about social innovation and when we think about the world, we're trying to kind of economic inclusion for everyone. That there are these people who have the opportunity, they have the skills and capability to work, but how do we not isolate them? And knowing that they they can have great working environments, um, so how do we support that? So looking forward. Um, to this concept and building out on this theory. I, I hope that there's more, more work on this. I know I would like to continue working on it. Um, you know, I often, you know, was thinking about, I really had to focus because of my time period on the, you know, the seven days that I was there about, you know, what was the impact of the women working within the organization, but what happens outside because they still have their social stigma. So what happens in their communities or in their own homes? So that would be interesting work, um, work um, research to continue. Um, in addition, you know, this was, Tony was built around um, specifically employing these socially stigmatized women. But what happens if someone who's stigmatized actually goes into an organization that already employs non-stigmatized? And what are those support structures? So here um, we might have kind of rules and regulations and policies around that in a corporation and support structures that, that help people who might be sick. But traditionally in places like Cambodia, they don't. So what happens um, if they happen to go into another organization where um, they, they could be stigmatized or they have to kind of keep their, their stigma hidden? And then finally, knowing that, you know, the social construction of stigma differs across, you know, geography and culture. Um, this would be an interesting study to kind of replicate in other areas. So what does this mean in India? What does it mean in a place in Africa or somewhere in South America? Thank you.